So, now we get into the word. And by the way, my humor is never planned. Sometimes it wakes us up. Good. Wait a minute. <laughs> We are still in Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to, uh, we got a couple, I'm thinking about two more weeks where we're going to kind of go through um, a little bit slowly, and then we're going to kind of speed up here, because there's something that I really want to get to by November, okay? Um, but we are in uh, Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has complaints against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Last week we talked about meek, being meek. Now I'm, I'm going through these slowly because this is important stuff. See, this is the character description of what those that are plugged into the vine, those who have new life in Christ, this is the fruit, what the fruit of your life should look like, increasingly. Okay? Now keep in mind, increasingly. You know, as you come to Christ, you're going to have buds. And then as you mature in Christ, you'll see little bits of fruit start showing up. And then as you come into maturity in Christ, there should be fruit. You should be able to look at that and go, oh, there's a grape. Or a blueberry. I still don't know what that guy gave me. <laughs> well, Christian threw them away, so I'll never know. But the, these things are significant. Because when you are looking at yourself in the mirror, by the way, I don't know about you guys, but I don't ever look at myself in the mirror. I don't ever really look until last night when I was shaving. I'm growing my beard back. It's growing. The process has begun. Okay. Especially after I got in the car this morning and Thaddeus told me, now I see how much you look like Uncle Todd. <laughs> yeah. You're still grounded. <laughs> but when we look into the mirror of our lives, these are the things that we should see. We should see these things reflected back to us. Okay? And they're significant because these are the very attributes of God. You know, the term Christian came about in Antioch. They used it as a term of derision, a term of mocking. Saying, oh, you're, do, you're those little Christ people, ha, ha, ha. And they said, yeah, yeah, that's really what we are. We're the reflected image of Christ to this world. As he is, so should we be. And so we took it on as a name of pride, a badge of honor. Now, keep in mind, we take on all that that means. Everything that that means. Okay. So, not only are we now the children of God, but we also, you know, there, there's the passage that says, Oh, that I may know him, not only in the joy of his resurrection, but also in the fellowship of his suffering. And that's part of the nature that we take on as well. So it's important that we know, we understand what these things are. Because this is the fruit that is in our lives. So, last week we talked about meekness. And meekness is not what? Weakness. 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 Meekness is strength controlled. Strength controlled. Okay? This week we're talking about patience. Now my plan was to do meekness and patience last week. But God was teaching me patience. Because I had to wait till this week to do it. And I'll tell you, of, of all of these that are in here, patience is one that I really struggle with. I think that's why God put me in a house on East Side Highway. <laughs> Because I, I don't like to speak. I don't speak. 
but I like to go the speed limit. Whether it be 45 or 65, I want to do the speed limit. <coughs> what is with the drivers on East Side Highway? <laughs> okay, 65 till you get to a town. Six, five. There's a six and there's a five. There's no 45 in there anywhere. You only get to 45 on the way through to 65. <laughs> and they have such fun doing it. <laughs> and they're so pleasant when you drive by and they wave at you. <laughs> but, and it always happens. Every time I get on the highway, it happens. And I have to remind myself, okay, this is the lesson. Uh, obviously, I haven't mastered this lesson yet. But I'm still going through it. But that's the, one of the few areas of my life that really I get very impatient with. So, what is patience? Well, Miriam Webster says, able to remain calm and not become annoyed when waiting for a long time or when dealing with problems or difficult people. See, that's all the East Side Highway for me. <laughs> <laughs> then, then they do construction on it, too. Going further, it says, done in a careful way over a long period of time without hurrying. Bearing pains or trials calmly or without complaint. My score is being gradually reduced as I read these. Manifesting forbearance under provocation or strain. Not hasty or impetuous. Steadfast despite opposition, difficulty, or adversity. Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci said, Patience serves as a protection against wrongs as clothes do against cold. For if you put on more clothes as the cold increases, it will have no power to hurt you. So in like manner, you must grow in patience when you meet with great wrongs, and they will be powerless to vex your mind. That. Now, reading this, the word in the Greek, I'm not going to give you Greek, it doesn't matter because you're not going to walk out and tell anybody. If you want, you can come over my nose. Um, there's two primary interpretations of this word patience and endurance. Okay? And it's funny because this word is actually used interchangeably with another word in the Greek, which ironically has the same two interpretations, except the primary one is endurance, and then the secondary is patience. As a matter of fact, in um, Revelation chapter 13, it says this calls for patient endurance on the parts of the saints. That's, that's these words. Okay? So they're, they're used in juxtaposition so you understand how important it is. Okay. Now, why does God care if we're patient? I mean, think about this for a minute. To God, a thousand years is as a minute. And we got 70 some. So doesn't it make sense that we would tend to be impatient people? Because we got a lot to try and squeeze into 70 some years. My granddaughter's smiling at <laughs> I mean, think about it. In that 70 years, you've got to learn to walk. You've got to learn to talk. And then it's not enough that you learn to talk, you've got to learn English. At least we do. Which makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> Goose and geese, moose and mooses. <laughs> so, we have a lot that has to be squeezed in. Well, then, then you know, we, we learn to walk, and some of us learn to talk somewhat, and we go through school and we've got to do our ciphers, and we've got to do our spelling, and we've got to learn about cutting apart frogs, which I mean any boy that grows up in the country already knows about. <laughs> so, you know, we get all that and then we know everything. And we're ready to move out of mom and dad's house, and mom and dad are ready for us to move out of the house. And that's great the way that it works. So we move out. And we get on our own and we realize we haven't learned anything. And we're back to square one and we got to square one. <coughs> and mom and dad just smile and laugh. Yeah. <laughs> yep. and, and so we go on. So then we, you know, get on our own and as time goes by we 
get married and start a family and realize that we still know nothing. You know, it's a whole lot easier to be on the infant side crying and pooping and eating than it is to be on the parent side dealing with that. So then we, we kind of learn into that and then our kids get to the point where they know everything. And we're ready for them to get out of the house. And the cycle goes on. Well, and we have 70 years to get all of this done. To make lifelong friends. To see things. I mean, you know, I have not yet, well, yeah, I've been out of this country if you count Tijuana. <laughs> Which I don't, because it's just more like southern San Diego. That's the only place I've been outside of this country. Now, my dad was in the Navy. My dad's been everywhere. You know, he was on a ship and they went, and he used to send us postcards and money, which I guess you can't do now. He would send us money from all the different ports that he went into. And so we have all these postcards and all these pictures of my dad visiting all these different places, wonderful places. And, and that was his, you know, that was his life. That's what he loved to do. My dad was a traveler. Stevensville is a little too far for me. <laughs> you know? If we could kind of scoot Stevensville a little bit closer to Birch Creek, that would be good for me. So, and that's okay. But we have 70 some years to squish all this stuff in. It makes sense that we would be an impatient people, doesn't it? Now, think about, as an infant, I'm, I'm using my, my beautiful granddaughter there, Annalise. I love my granddaughter. She's beautiful, she smiles, she's, she's got a good personality. <laughs> but when she wants something, does she want it tomorrow? No. She wants it right now. Hey, it's time to eat. Yeah, 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 we'll get to you in a minute. No, you don't understand. It's time to eat right now. <laughs> yeah, yes, we are. Yes, you're beautiful. We love you. You know what? But i got to take care of this. No, you don't. You need to get over here. Right now and feed me! <laughs> yeah, and she gets fed. And somehow or another, we think that's going to work as we get older. <coughs> so, it makes sense that we would be an impatient people, okay? And I, I kind of laugh because I'm convinced that's part of the curse. Now, I'm not sure what of all that is part of the curse. We know that death is as a result of the curse. But how, how do we fit this together? Because if everything around us has led us to be a people of impatience, why then does God say... Be patient. Well, um, it's his nature. That's who he is. He is a patient God. And we are called to be like him. We are called to be a people that reflect who he is to the nature around us. Now, one of the ways that God describes this is being a light to the world. Now, it's really funny, but I could stand up here with 50 matches, light them all up and hold them in a bundle, and, and that would look really cool, but it wouldn't really mean a whole lot because we've got the lights on, right? But if we turn the lights out and I light those same 50 matches and hold them up, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Now, one of the problems that I see with Christians in church today as the only time they unveil their lives is in a lit place. The only time a lot of Christians unveil their life is in church. We, we keep our faith to ourselves. You know, we might come across somebody at work that says, uh, makes a comment about, you know, they got to go to church on Sunday so they're not going to be able to make the game. Oh, you're a Christian? A little bit of that light, you know, we unshutter a little bit, a little bit of our light peeks out, but we carefully direct it to the one that we know has the light so that we can shine our light at each other and, you know, mutually admire our light. <clears throat> and our light comes together at church and we unveil and there's light and that's, that's a good thing. Problem is, we're not supposed to be doing that because we're supposed to be keeping it unveiled at all times. Where is the light most effective? In the dark. The dark is out there. You know, we come in here that uh, if our light is weak, if our light's tired, it can be encouraged, it can be renewed, it can be strengthened. 
so that we can take it out there and it will be effective against the dark. Well, being patient is part of that light. You know, all of these attributes that we've listed here, that's all part of that light. It all makes up that light. So, God's patience. I just, I, I've got a couple passages for you. You don't have to turn here. There's, there's one I'll get to that I'll ask you to turn in a minute. But Romans 2, verse 4 says, or do, you presume, or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? See, see God is patient. He forbears. And He's kind. It's these things that draw us, that lead us to repentance, to changing what we're doing. Okay? We're going this way, and it's exposed to us, and we turn around and we go back this way. Okay? Now, we, now we use a lot of terms in churches, and I just want to kind of catch us up here so we're all understanding what we're talking about. Okay? What does repentance mean? Yeah, to turn away. To repent. I'm doing this, now I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that anymore. Okay? So we're, we're turning away. What does confession mean? Yeah, you agree. Okay. What does sin mean? Hey, yeah, you missed the mark. It's an archery term. It's a term. Now, see, this is one of the problems with our understanding of the New Testament. Because when Paul and Peter were writing in the New Testament, they were writing using terms that would be easily understood to the people they were writing to. Now, it's hunting season here. I know we got a lot of archers in here. And I don't know what the actual term would be. But sin is actually the measure by which you miss your target. Okay? And it doesn't matter whether the measure is this big or the measure is this big or the, the measure is the entirety of the universe. It's that measure that is called sin. You're aiming here and you miss by that much. Okay? So we understand that sin is God has called us to this measure which is perfection. Without blemish, without spot, absolutely perfect. And we miss it. We miss it. Now, you know, well, I only missed it by this much. It doesn't matter. Because if there's any blemish, you're not worthy. So the first thing that we need to understand is there needs to be a confession. We need to have an understanding illuminated to us by God's Spirit that, yeah, I, I, I messed up. I sinned. I was wrong. I know this is what you called me to, and this is where I am. Confession. I'm agreeing with God that He's right, I'm wrong. Okay, so there's confession. Then there's repentance. <coughs> okay, now, one of the things that, that really chaps me is when people throw out, I'm, I'm sorry, forgive me, when they don't mean it. Okay, asking for forgiveness is not the same as repenting. Asking for forgiveness is important. That's a part of confession. You understand that you did wrong. That you've offended him. <coughs> but how would it work for you if somebody offended you and said, I'm sorry, and went and did it again? You wouldn't believe them after a few times, would you? You're not really sorry. Repentance requires that we turn away. Now, the reason I don't like when people go, I'm sorry, is because that was one of Christy's favorite tactics in an argument as we started to grow in Christ. Because she knew that once she said she was sorry, what was my responsibility? To forgive. Argument had to be over. <laughs> I had to stop my argument and go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> illustrates the point because oftentimes when we are confronted with sin, when we are confronted with an area of weakness, if we ask for forgiveness, that's appropriate, that's right, but that's not sufficient. We're called to repent. Going this way, God says, hey, you're not supposed to do that. You're right, confession. You're right. That's that's I'm not supposed to do that. God, I'm sorry. That's repentance. Okay? That's repentance. So, 
Going back, Romans chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Now think about that for a minute. Look at that word. Riches. These are attributes that are to be admired. So if we are speaking to the absolute perfect being, the only one in all of the universe, God, and he is rich in these, and he considers that to be a good thing, wouldn't it then follow that we would only be better by emulating these? And he says, the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not knowing that these, that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Romans chapter 9, verse 22. It says, what if God, desiring to know his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Now, uh, you guys read, read this in context, okay? I just want to get to one point in this verse, okay? God has been offended, grievously offended by mankind. You know, last week I, I made the comment, you guys smell good. And that's actually uh, a scriptural reference because we are pleasing the Roma. Before God, with the blood of Christ, we are a pleasing aroma. And, and the thing is, the contrast to that is without Him, we are a stench. We stink. Mankind has become a stench in God's nostrils. Okay? God desiring to show His wrath and to make known His power. God wants to put things right. He wants to set his house in order. But, thank God for but. Because he says, why it has endured with much patience. He's showing patience. The vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Why is God showing the patience? Why is God doing that? Why? Why? If God is just, and pouring out his wrath on mankind. <coughs> Why is he showing patience and not doing that? His mercy. His mercy. What does his end result? What does he want? More people to come to him. God desires that all men would be saved. That's what his heart's desire is. He does not desire to send anyone away from him. But away you'll go if you don't accept him. His patience is put into place for our benefit. I was struggling this week, earlier this week. Um, Chris and I were talking and I've been looking in scripture for some things because I, I get frustrated that God doesn't show forth his power more. I get frustrated that God, when I hear some of the things come across the television that people say, Hey, God, remember, open up the earth and suck them down. <laughs> Go ahead. It's okay. And I was talking with Christy because not only do I not see God reveal his power against the sinners, but a lot of times I don't see him revealing his power for the saints either. You know? Um, reading stories about the churches of brothers and sisters over in Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa. And these are, are people that, that their love for God is such that suffering abuse, separation from their family, murder. Um, you know, I hope that if that ever comes to this country, I'm the one martyred. Because I think it would be much harder to be the one, to be the spouse that's left behind. Or the parent that's left behind, or the child that's left behind. And I was kind of frustrated, and, and I started looking at Scripture, and, and I came to a certain awareness. <coughs> I believe, because of these passages, that God is not showing forth His hand for our benefit. For our benefit. You know, in Zechariah, it talks about the last days. And it talks about what a horrible thing that that is. 
it's going to be terrible. Jesus makes reference to it and says, don't even stop and get your coat. Just run for the hills. Okay. It's going to be horrible. Now, our hope, what we stand on, we are not subjects of his wrath. His wrath is not targeted at his people. Matter of fact, go back to Egypt. God separating out the Egyptians and the Israelites, and he's calling down, he's pouring out his wrath on Egypt. What happened to the Israelites? Yeah, and you realize they weren't just protected from the, the angel of death that came. You realize they were protected before that. When that hail fell, well, that's hard to say. <laughs> hail fell, it fell on the Egyptians, but not on the Israelites. When things went bad, the Israelites were protected. They were sheltered. They were covered. Okay? Scripture tells us that we are not objects of God's wrath. Now, I, I don't care whether you believe pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Really, one of these days we're all going to find out who's right and who's wrong. But I will tell you this. It doesn't matter when you think we're going. Things are going to get ugly before we go. That's right. Okay? Because even if you believe in a pre-trib stance, the world has got to be set in such a place, the stage has to be set, that the Antichrist will rise. Wars, rumors of wars, famines, plagues. That's what's going to give the Antichrist such credibility, because he's going to come in and he's going to settle everything down. And everybody's going to go, oh look, a savior! But it's going to be ugly before that. Ugly. Okay? So, patience. 1 Timothy 1.16 But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. I love this passage, because this is me. I, man, I just, I relate with Paul. Listen to what he says. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience. I am the perfect example for Jesus to display patience. Me. I give him so much cause for your patience. Okay, Glenn. Got to learn this lesson again. I need to go to Hamilton. Go on east side. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it again. Come on. But look, he's going to just and, and, and this, the cool thing is, it's not just displaying patience, he's displaying what kind of patience? Perfect patience. Now, let me just kind of share something with you here. Perfect <coughs> patience doesn't mean wishy-washy and inability to stand. Alright? Don't confuse being weak knee with having a lot of patience. Just because you lack the fortitude to stand up for what is right does not mean that you're just being patient. <clears throat> okay? God isn't calling us to cowardice. Think about what he has called us to be. Do you arm civilians? When you're getting ready to go into battle, do you arm the nurses? Do you arm the accountants? No, you arm the warriors. <coughs> You arm those who are going to do battle. You don't take all your armament and leave it back in the city and send your warriors out unarmed. Unless you're Sparta, which is why they don't exist today. <laughs> God has called us to be a people of might and of power, that through us he might display his power. Okay? Being patient is part of that. Not being weak need. Not just throwing in the towel, and being uh, unwilling to stand up against sin. Being patient. Okay. The perfect patience. Um, flip with me, if you would, to 2 Timothy. Chapter 4. Now, I'm going to share out of Paul's letter to Timothy, but I want you to be cautious. Because when we read 
a lot of these. We tend to focus them only on its intended target from the writer. We need to remember that God included this in his word to us. So everything that is in here has application to us. So when Paul was sitting down and he's writing to Timothy and he says what he's going to say, God felt that that was stuff that he inspired unto Timothy and he inspired unto us. Okay? So when you read this, you have to look at personal application. What's good for Timothy is good for me. So he says, chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. With complete patience and teaching. Now, I want, I'm, well, let me finish reading, then I'll come back and I'll call it this. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You realize this is God speaking to you. Speaking to you. Okay? God is reaching down through Paul's writing to Timothy and he's speaking to each and every one of us. And I want you to notice a couple things on what God is revealing you. Because this is important. Remember, I don't believe there's anything in here on accident. Nothing slipped by God. Okay? Preach the word. Okay? Are we all called to preach? Well, what does preach mean? <coughs> Good, be proclaimers. Now, not, not all of you is called to stand up here and deliver a sermon. St. Augustine made the comment, preach always, if necessary, use words. Our lives should be a testimony. Our lives should be a preaching. Our lives should be a message. We should always be able to back up what we say, what we do with what we say. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience. How often do you hear rebuke with patience? Now, doesn't that seem kind of like an oxymoron? I mean, rebuke is harsh. That's when you call someone on the carpet and you tell them, no. You cannot do that. You have to stop. I have an issue this week that I have to deal with where there is probably going to be reproving, possibly rebuking to a brother in Christ. I haven't figured out how to do that with patience. So pray for me. Because I want to speak God's truth in God's love. Okay? But he says, do these things with complete patience. When these things come up, see, we're, we're not reactors. We don't have to, oh, you've offended me, now I'm mad, I'm going to get you. That should never be a part of it. Remember, Paul also tells us, do not be eager to take offense. Don't be easily offended. Don't let them get your goat. Be above that. Be better than that. Let's go back to our example. Jesus Christ brought before the Sanhedrin. Liars stand up and, and they, they can't even lie right. They can't even get their story straight. With complete patience, he dealt with them. Brought before Pilate, who understands none of this, but I think had more of God's Spirit in him than the entire Sanhedrin combined. Because he didn't want to kill him. He saw that he was a righteous man. But that's not enough. Okay? With complete patience. With complete patience, he went to the cross. With complete patience.
and teaching. Now, do you realize that we all are called to teach, but only some of us are called to be teachers? You go, uh, what? <laughs> See, all of us, by the example of our lives, by our familiarity with God's scripture, we're all going to teach. We have to be able to teach. That's what being ready in season and out of season means. Be prepared to give an answer. When people want to know why you believe what you believe, that's teaching. Okay? But not all of us are called to be teachers in a setting like this or, or in Sunday school or, or small groups or things like that. There are certain people who are gifted with that. It's just like, you know, the difference between uh, an evangelist and a witness. You know, we're, we're all called to evangelism in that we all have witness. We all have a testimony that we're called to share. We're not to keep it huddled up. We're to, to tell people about it. I had cancer and I got a cure. And you can have a cure. But there are certain people that have the gift of evangelism that they can't stop. I got to work at it. I got to think about it. And oftentimes I think about it after that. Oh, that was I missed that opportunity. But there are other people that just can't stop. And you, you really don't want to be standing in line with them because sometimes it's embarrassing. <laughs> okay? Just because God has gifted certain people into certain areas does not exonerate, does not excuse you from your responsibility in those areas. Okay? When you come to Christ, you are given a set of tasks that is given unto you to be His witness. There's the gift of an evangelist. To be able to teach, to instruct, to talk to people about why, why do you believe this? Uh, I don't know. Well, there goes your witness. You've got to be able to do these things. But with patient endurance. Now, I'm going to jump back in my notes. How do we develop patience? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> be patient with me. <laughs> Real quick, I'm just, I'm just gonna. How do we develop patience? First, it is a gift of God's Spirit. It is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5:22. This is one of those things that, as God's Spirit is in you, will begin to grow. We work so hard to keep that fruit small. Number two, it is given according to His glorious might. Uh, Colossians. We're going to flip back to Colossians 1:11. Uh, don't, don't worry about flipping there. I'll just read it to you. Colossians 1:11. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. That's because of God's strength. Okay? Number three. <laughs> this is the one I hate. <laughs> James chapter one. Okay? And this is great. So long as it's God just giving it to me, I'm all on board with this. I'm cool. And then we get to James chapter 1. Verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfast. <coughs> That's that same word there, patience. Patience. Patient endurance. See, God gives us this. It's like he gave you a muscle. The only way to strengthen it is to work it, to use it, to make use of it. I was in a wheelchair for about two months when I was uh, about 12 years old. I had some stuff going on with my legs. They weren't really sure what it was. and I was in a wheelchair for about two months. And after we got things straightened out, they got me back up on my feet and I was able to, to get going. And I found that I had difficulty going up and down stairs. And it was funny because you would think going downstairs would be easier, but it wasn't. It was actually harder because I had to control the fall. I mean, sometimes not so successfully. You know, you take that first two steps and you go, wow, i got ten more to go and I'm pooped. And sometimes I would just sit and do, 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 down. Well, those muscles hadn't been working. Now, it didn't take very long for them to gain back their strength. It just required me to walk. Okay, that's, that was what was required. Patience, if you want patience to grow, 
And let me, let me change that. We need patience to grow. Okay, first, it's a gift of God's Spirit. It's given to us by His mighty power. And then He sets us in situation and circumstance that will test that and refine that and grow that and make it strong. I go back to what Brother Yoon said after coming to America. And he found out that the church in America was praying for the, the relief of the church in China. And he said, don't pray for the relief of the pressure. Pray for strength to endure. Pray for strength to endure. Because he saw what the relief of pressure did to the churches in America. We got a bunch of couch potato Christians. Armchair witnesses. Fat and lazy and sassy. But completely weak. So don't, 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 don't pray that for us. Pray for strength that we can endure. God will put situation and circumstance in your life that will test your patience. Now, I, I speak light of Eastside Highway. Okay? But I, I am firmly convinced that God is doing that because even in that area, He's wanting to grow me. He's wanting to grow me. He's wanting to grow me. And I see my weakness in that. Driving down the road, and it's like, okay, 65, not 55, 65. Oh, you're talking on your phone. Isn't that lovely? Get off the road. <laughs> Pull over and talk on your phone. Now, very rarely do I have to be anywhere in a hurry. And God knows that. God knows that. Um, last Sunday, getting down to Life Chain, which by the way, 300 people showed up to Life Chain, 46 of them from this church. <laughs> that is an incredible testimony, and I pray God's blessing on you because of that. I was late. I wanted to be there at 2.15, and we got out of here a little bit late, and um, you know, for whatever reason, I was thinking of the distance from my house to Hamilton, not from Stevensville to Hamilton. And there's a difference. <laughs> and there was a convoy of four very slow cars. And they were just far enough apart that you couldn't get in between them. We still made it on time. God still got us where we needed to go right exactly where we needed to be there. Another lesson for Glenn, chalk it up. I'm on manual number two. Now manual number one is full. Number two is getting full. Patience, why? Because it's his nature. He is so patient with us. We need to exhibit the same patience. First, exhibit it in your family. Isn't it funny that the people that we tend to be the least patient with are the people that we love the most? Isn't that so funny? I can be so impatient at home. Satch, remember me asking you to put that movie away? Yeah? But it's not away. So go do it now. When mom asked me to go do the, okay, do that after we do mine. We, we can be so impatient with the people that we love. Patience with the brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't be easy to offend. Don't let things bug you. Be patient. Be patient in your workplace. Be patient with the sinners. They don't know any better. They have no spirit of God in them to instruct them, to teach them, to illumine to them these things. They're acting out of a base carnal knowledge that is without God. Gosh, I should be easy to be patient with. Yeah, shouldn't it be easy to be patient with stupid people? <coughs> ignorant people? I'm going to change that because it's not stupidity, it's ignorance. And there is a big difference. Okay? I can deal with ignorant people. <coughs> ignorance means you just don't know. Stupid people, not so much because they like their ignorance. They enjoy it. Those I struggle with a little bit. So patience. It's a part of his nature. It should flow out from us. He's going to put us into situation and circumstance. It's going to grow it, strengthen it, have strong patience muscles. 
Amen.